the liver is the second largest organ in our body after the skin and carries out more than 500 functions. But in today's bio world, I will only discuss two functions according to the STPM syllabus. Let's first get to know the structure of the liver and the function of its components. The liver is positioned below the diaphragm. To the left of the liver will be the stomach and just below the liver, that is to the right of the liver, will be the duodenum. The liver has three major blood vessels. Two are connected to the heart. The hepatic artery will transport oxygenated blood from the heart into the liver and the hepatic vein will transport deoxygenated blood from the liver back to the heart. The third blood vessel is connected to the ileum. The hepatic portal vein will transport nutrient-rich blood from the ileum to the liver. The blood will be rich in glucose and amino acid. The next important structure in the liver is the gallbladder. The gallbladder only stores bile. It doesn't synthesize bile. It is the liver cells that synthesize bile and the bile will then be transported into the gallbladder for storage. The gallbladder then will release the bile and channel it into the duodenum via the bile duct. Liver tissues are arranged in structures called lobules. In this microscopic image of a cross section of the liver, the liver lobule is very clear. Let me outline it for you. Inside this liver lobule, there are smaller structures called the acinus. Acinus contains a central vein, and on the far end, we will have another three vessels. I'll use a 3D model to describe the components of the acinus so that it's easier for you to picture. The center here is the hepatic venule, branch of the hepatic vein. On the far end here, you see the three vessels. Hepatic arteriole, branch of hepatic artery. Hepatic portal venule, branch of hepatic portal vein. And the bile ductile. The bile ductile will actually drain bile or transport bile from the liver cells into the gallbladder for storage. If we look at a two-dimensional diagram of the acinus, we can also label similarly. The center is the hepatic venule and the far end you have the three vessels, the hepatic arteriole, the hepatic portal vein and the bile ductile. The structure of the acinus is completed with many liver cells, which we call hepatocytes. And this is where all of the liver's biochemical processes occur, including the synthesis of bile. The hepatocytes are loosely arranged, so there is space in between the strings of the hepatocytes, and this space is called sinusoid. Inside the sinusoid, blood from the arterioles and the venules will mix. This way, it can provide oxygen and nutrients to the hepatocytes. We also have a passage leading to the bile ductile called the canaliculus. The canaliculus will drain the bile from the hepatocytes that are synthesizing bile and direct it into the bile ductile. Later, the bile ductile will transport it into the gallbladder. Now, if you notice, inside the sinusoid, there are some amoeba-like cells. These cells are called the Kuffer cells. The function of the Kuffer cells are to destroy any bacteria 
that infects the liver by phagocytosis. Now we are familiar with the structure of liver. Let's move on to the function of liver. The first function is about carbohydrate metabolism, which includes glycogenesis, glycogenolysis, and gluconeogenesis. Carbohydrate metabolism is related to our diet. When we eat carbohydrate-rich food, the starch will be hydrolyzed into glucose and the glucose will diffuse into our blood. Normal blood glucose levels are around 6 millimoles per liter. But if you eat like him, most definitely you are going to experience hyperglycemia. That is when blood glucose concentrations are much higher than 6 millimoles per liter. Now, if homeostasis was not happening efficiently, then this boy will be suffering from diabetes mellitus. But when homeostasis functions efficiently, a negative feedback mechanism occurs. So, in homeostasis, the increase in blood glucose concentration must be detected by glucoreceptors. Glucoreceptors are located in the hypothalamus. So, what will hypothalamus do with the information? Upon detecting the increase in blood glucose concentration, hypothalamus will transmit impulse to the pancreas. The pancreas is a special organ because it is both an exocrine gland as well as an endocrine gland. This part of the pancreas contains pancreatic cells that will synthesize enzymes like amylase, lipase and trypsin, making it an exocrine gland. While this part of the pancreas contains the islet of Langerhans cells that synthesize hormones, making it an endocrine gland. The outer cells are known as the alpha Langerhans cells and the inner cells are known as the beta Langerhans cells. Since the hypothalamus has detected hyperglycemia, the hypothalamus will stimulate the beta Langerhans cells in the pancreas to secrete insulin. Insulin will bind to receptors located on hepatocytes as well as liver cells. When the insulin bind to the receptors, they will increase the permeability of the cells towards glucose. So more glucose will begin to diffuse into the cell from the blood. In this way, the cells will start to use the glucose for respiration. And if there is excess glucose, the glucose will be converted into glycogen by the process known as glycogenesis. So in this way, the glucose concentration in the blood will return to normal. Although the liver is an extremely hard-working organ, there are occasions when the liver is unable to function efficiently, such as in diabetes mellitus. There are two types of diabetes mellitus. Type 1 involves the pancreas. The pancreas is unable to synthesize insulin. This happens when the white blood cells, cytotoxic T cells, begin to destroy the beta Langerhans cells. When the immune system begins to attack its own host, it is called an autoimmune disorder. This condition occurs in individuals below 20 years of age. Since this type of diabetes is related to the synthesis of insulin, type 1 diabetes is also known as insulin-dependent diabetes. Type 2, on the other hand, is related to the liver cells, the hepatocytes. The hepatocytes have developed resistance to insulin, meaning that 
they do not respond to the insulin hormone anymore. This could happen because genetically, a person is born with hepatocytes that have less receptors towards insulin or could be due to overuse. Diets rich in carbohydrate or obesity may have caused the hepatocytes to become less sensitive. Aging can also be a factor whereby the receptors are lost from the hepatocytes. Now, since this has nothing to do with the level of insulin, type 2 diabetes mellitus is also known as non-insulin dependent. As I mentioned earlier, the liver is an extremely hard-working organ. Even when you don't eat, the liver still has to work. You see, when you don't eat, your glucose concentration in the blood starts to decrease to be below 6 millimoles per liter. So you will experience hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia will be detected by the glucoreceptor in the hypothalamus and the hypothalamus will transmit an impulse to the pancreas. Earlier, the pancreas was stimulated by hyperglycemia and in response, the pancreas secreted insulin. But this time, the pancreas is being stimulated due to hypoglycemia. So in response, the pancreas is going to activate the alpha langerhans cells to secrete glucagon. Glucagon also has receptors on both the hepatocytes as well as muscle cells. So when glucagon binds to these receptors, it will cause glycogenolysis to occur in these cells. Glycogenolysis is the breaking down of glycogen to form glucose. These glucose molecules then will diffuse into blood to increase the glucose concentration in the blood. If the amount of glucose is still not sufficient, the next step will be gluconeogenesis. That is, the breakdown of fatty acids and amino acids to help generate energy. So in this way, the blood glucose level will return to normal. Although muscle cells and liver cells both respond to insulin and glucagon, the biochemical processes carried out by them is slightly different. The reason for this is the enzyme glucose 6-phosphatase. This enzyme is only found in hepatocytes. Muscle cells don't have this enzyme. So let's see how the absence of this enzyme affects the biochemical process. Here I have the hepatocyte and the muscle cell divided by blood flow. When there is hyperglycemia, pancreas will secrete insulin, which will make the membranes of both cells more permeable to glucose. The glucose then is oxidized into carbon dioxide, water and energy. If there is excess glucose, then glycogenesis occurs. Insulin will activate a series of enzymes that will help convert glucose into glycogen for storage. From the series of enzymes, the first enzyme, hexokinase, is irreversible. All the other enzymes are reversible. If you notice, the glycogenesis in hepatocyte and the glycogenesis in the muscle cells are exactly the same. Now, let's look at what happens when hypoglycemia is detected. In hypoglycemia, glycogenolysis must occur to help increase the blood glucose concentration. To do that, pancreas will secrete the hormone glucagon. Let's look at what glucagon does in the hepatocyte first. 
glucagon will cause glycogen to be broken down into glucose. Now, the enzymes of the pathway are mostly reversible. So, the same enzymes will be used, except the step where glucose 6-phosphate converts into glucose. In this step, hexokinase is irreversible, so a new enzyme is used. That enzyme is glucose 6-phosphatase. So, muscle cells don't have this enzyme. Therefore, glycogenolysis in muscle cell is going to be different. Glycogen will be converted to glucose 1-phosphate. Glucose 1-phosphate will be converted to glucose 6-phosphate. But since the enzyme is absent, glucose 6-phosphate cannot be converted to glucose. Instead, glucose 6-phosphate will be converted into pyruvate. Pyruvate will be converted into lactate. Lactate then is transported to the hepatocyte where hepatocyte will convert lactate back into pyruvate. Pyruvate will be converted to glucose 6-phosphate and by using the enzyme glucose 6-phosphatase, glucose will be generated once more. So you can see the process of glycogenolysis in the hepatocyte is different than in muscle cells due to glucose 6-phosphatase. The pathway that generates glucose from pyruvate or from lactate is called gluconeogenesis. And this whole pathway that includes both the muscle cell and the hepatocyte is known as Cori cycle. So now you know how as a team we are involved in carbohydrate metabolism. I'll see you in part two on protein metabolism. Bye-bye.